Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. Imagine one day you were shopping on eBay and you wanted to relive your old PC XT experiences as a kid. So you pulled the trigger on an old XT machine like this Leading Edge XT. You got the machine home after it was shipped to you and luckily it wasn't broken. You hooked it all up, you powered it on, and then you quickly realized that, well, there was absolutely nothing you could do with this thing because it didn't come with any disks, it didn't come with a hard drive, and all it does is boot up and tell you that it needs a boot floppy. After a little bit of Googling, you realize that making floppy disks, the five and a quarter inch variety that this thing needs, is a little bit harder than it used to be. So in this video, I'm gonna talk about this card, which is a software-defined card using a Raspberry Pi Pico 2040 that you can plug into a computer just like this leading edge and actually get booted up into DOS and add a whole bunch of extra functionality with just this one simple card. So without further ado, let's take a closer look at this card and see what it's all about. This is the card I'm talking about. It's the ISA PicoMem, and this is the latest revision as of the making of this video. The little tagline here says it all. This is the all-in-one emulation board, ROM, RAM, EMS, so extended memory, micro SD, Wi-Fi, USB, dot, dot, dot. The dot, dot, dot's really important because constantly new features are being added to this, even though this only just came out for sale to the general public. Now, I've been playing around with this board a little bit and I have a good feeling for how it works. Now, I've even created a little note here just to remind me of some of the little things that I figured out playing around with this. This board was sent into the basement by Freddie, who is the person that came up with the idea of this. And the note says, hi, Adrian, here's a Pico Mem 1.11 that is more easy to use than the 1.0. And uh, yeah, I have a 1.0 board as well, which I picked up at VCF Midwest last year in 2023. So there's already been some hardware changes that have improved the safety and functionality of the card, which is why Freddie went ahead and sent me the latest one. Now, people who are used to PCs or watch a lot of my videos might have watched that intro and said, oh, there's no problem if you bought a machine like that without any kind of cards or discs or whatever. You just have to buy some accessories like an XT IDE and a RAM card and a GoTech drive to emulate the floppy drive. And then you'll be able to boot up DOS and get a hard drive here and play some games off this. No problem. The thing is, buying all those components separately starts to add up really quickly. So it'd be kind of cool if you could just have one card that could do everything and you just could buy this once instead of having to buy a bunch of separate components. We can see that the Pico Mem is designed as a way to emulate ISA boards on the PC, and it's all doing it inside the Raspberry Pi Pico. So this is a software-defined card, which means new features are very easy to add to this with firmware updates because the Pi Pico is emulating all of these features. The board itself, besides the Raspberry Pi 2040, has level shifters, an eight megabyte PS RAM chip, so that's like a serial type of RAM chip that's talking to the Raspberry Pi Pico, and it also has an SD card slot. The card that Freddie sent me and the one in this picture here also has the Wi-Fi module on the RP2040 board. That's this little can right here. So from a functionality standpoint, that gives us memory emulation with 16 kilobyte address granularity. That means that you can expand your conventional memory that's below 640K with this card, but you can also add EMS memory to your machine with this card, and you can give yourself upper memory with this card as well. That's high memory. It also gives you ROM emulation. So there are two ROM slots on this thing where you can load custom ROMs into it. So if you have some kind of a diagnostic ROM you wanna run on your computer, for instance, it is possible to load that and then that will execute once the system boots up. It also can do floppy disk and hard drive emulation. Now, this is an interesting little caveat here. The way it emulates the hard drive and the floppy is not like the XT IDE or an actual floppy controller. It's actually more like the way DOSBox works. So you load floppy images or hard drive images onto the SD card, and then it patches the BIOS and it actually injects those right into the system and allows you to say mount floppy disk images even when your machine has a real floppy drive. Normally that wouldn't be possible because you'd have an IO conflict between you know, an emulated floppy drive controller and the real thing. 
but the way the Pico Mem is doing it is actually kind of cool and allows you to load those floppy images without affecting the operation of the internal floppy drive. It also gives you USB mouse support. So with the Raspberry Pi Pico, there's actually a USB port right there. And with a USB on the go connector to a regular USB A jack, you can plug a USB mouse into this so you don't need to worry about finding an old serial mouse. Along those same lines, we also get USB joystick support, which is currently X input style controllers and PlayStation 4 controllers. So you can plug an Xbox 360 controller into this, and then that will work in DOS games as well. Also in beta is network card emulation. So you can actually get your computer, your old PCXT online over Wi-Fi with this card. And I've tested it and it works. Freddie also recently added postcode support, which I haven't tested because I don't have the right little display to plug into this thing, but it gives you a little alphanumeric display that can then show diagnostic codes as the system boots to help you troubleshoot your machine. And there's actually one more thing that Freddie added that's not mentioned on the GitHub repo that I have tested and it's in very early alpha stages, but it's coming. And I've already modified my other one for this support. You look right here, you wonder what this is? It's plugged into that same header, which is on this board there, that header right there. This is a DAC or digital to analog converter. And that's a 3.5 millimeter output right there. And what this does with the custom pre-release firmware that's on this one, is this adds ad lib support <laughs> to the card as well. So yeah, while it's like booting your system and emulating disk drives and RAM and whatever, you also have an ad lib card now as well, all on this one thing. Freddie told me about this capability and I was really impressed that he had managed to somehow shoehorn that into this thing while it's still doing all the other emulation. And sure enough, he told me which DAC to buy. I picked this up from AliExpress. It was literally a couple dollars shipped. And when I installed this, put the firmware on here, fired up some ad lib stuff and it just worked. So there's a future functionality section here on the GitHub repo, and maybe I'm blowing the secret here with this ad lib stuff, but it does say that there's a bunch of new stuff coming, including remote control of your PC. So there's already like rudimentary support there. And obviously with the one with the Wi-Fi chip here, there could be a server that you connect to and you can remote control your PC XT through the Pico Mem. Also support for more USB devices like keyboards and joysticks already added, but maybe keyboards as well. That would be great because honestly, finding an XT keyboard with an old PC XT, it's not easy these days. I'm lucky and I have those, but not everyone's gonna have those. And you might not wanna spend the like hundred bucks or whatever people are asking for that stuff on eBay. And if this can do that in the future, That'll be even more awesome. This is what I was talking about with the ad lib support. <laughs> Freddie says he added a connector on the board that could open door to a lot of other stuff like secret stuff. So sorry, Freddie, if uh, the ad lib supports uh, secret, but I've sort of uh, spilled the beans on that one. So people are going to know about it and I will demo that in this video. It looks like Freddie is also trying to add Bluetooth support for Bluetooth game controllers. Now that will be freaking awesome because honestly, one of the problems with the Pi Pico is it's micro USB and finding a little USB on the go thing is a bit of a pain. I have a couple clone Pi Picos here that actually have USB type C. That makes it much easier to plug stuff into it. But this micro USB, you gotta use a little dongle. It's all sort of stupid. So with Bluetooth devices, like Bluetooth keyboard and mouse, how freaking awesome would that be? And the last thing is use of the quick connector to allow for uh, OLED screens and our real-time clocks, things like that. This little part right here is the quick connector. It's a specific standard I think Adafruit came up with and Adafruit sells a bunch of different things that can plug into this. So the postcode support I already mentioned plugs into this and it's a little LED display, but OLED screens and real-time clocks and other things are all possible. And these can be daisy chained because it is I squared C, which of course these have device addresses and stuff. That's a little bit of a bus. So as it sits right now in May, 2024, those are primarily the features that this thing has. And obviously the ad lib sound support is, well, that's new and coming. But Freddie is always telling me about constantly adding a bunch of new features to this card and enhancements and speed ups and other improvements, which is really cool. So the good thing is if you do buy one of these, it doesn't seem like at least right now that it's gonna be a dead product. And it seems like, you know, more and more features are gonna get added. That's just gonna make this more and more cool as time goes on. Now there are some compromises and limitations to what this card can do. And I'll talk about those a little bit later in the video because we'll definitely run into some of them in the testing. 
Right now, I wanted to address the question of cost and availability of this card. I've talked about lots of cool retro things in the past on the channel, and people were a bit disappointed that they were A, really expensive, or B, really hard or nearly impossible to get, or potentially both of those things. Luckily, with this card, I think both of those things aren't really going to be a concern, at least at the moment. When I got the Pico Man 1.0 card last year at VCF Midwest, Freddie asked me not to really talk about it too much, and I think I did talk about it on a Super Mini Mail call very briefly, but he didn't really want me to go too in-depth with it, because at the time, there was really nowhere to get this card, plus he was still really working hard on the firmware, and it was in a much earlier, more beta stage than it is right now. Luckily, Freddy's been actively working with some of the suppliers around the world to make the card available. And as of the other day, the card is now available for sale on TechSelect here. So for people in North America, this is especially good because uh, this is based in Texas. So shipping is not going to be particularly expensive. I know Kevin, who runs TechSelect, can send stuff anywhere in the world. But obviously, shipping charges are going to be higher if you're shipping to Europe or Australia. As far as I'm aware, Freddy is also working with someone in Europe to make this card. That way, you can order it from that supplier when that becomes available. And you can avoid the shipping charges and whatnot from the U.S. But as you can see, TechSelect has them ready to go and they are in the stock and they can be back ordered if for some reason Kevin sort of runs out of parts. But I think the parts that make up this card are very plentiful and very common. So there shouldn't be any issues making this card and keeping this in stock. And looking at the products that Kevin is selling here on TechSelect, it's kind of funny that this card sort of obsoletes several of these. Like he has a quad floppy controller. Well, it doesn't really obsolete the floppy controller because this has very specific use cases. But say you get a computer that doesn't have a floppy controller and you need to boot some floppy images with a GoTech, well, you can buy a floppy controller from Kevin and it's 60 bucks. We don't really need to if you have the Pico Mem because it can do it as well. And there you go. You just save yourself an extra 60 bucks. Kevin also sells the ReSound 2, which is an AdLib compatible card, and that's 40 bucks. So it's <laughs> the AdLib compatibility that's coming soon for the Pico Mem will sort of remove the need to have to buy a separate sound card. And then, of course, we have an XT IDE card. It is an open source project, so you can make them yourself, which I did right here. But if you want to buy one that's manufactured, it's, Kevin sells it for $50. Maybe you can find them cheaper elsewhere. But that's another card you don't really need because Pico Mem does that too. And then let's talk about EMS memory cards. That's the expanded, I think it's expanded memory. <laughs> There's a couple available on Kevin's website either. Kevin's going to hate me for talking about this stuff. There's a one meg one for, what is that, $57, and then two meg one for $77. And well, <laughs> Pico Mem, I think, can do up to like three megabytes of EMS memory. I think that's the limit it can go up to. And that's just included with, the, <laughs> with this card. So you don't need, um, you don't need one of those either. I think I should probably stop going through Kevin's website and talking about how this card obsoletes a bunch of other things. It doesn't actually totally obsolete everything directly. And that's because of course, like I mentioned, there were a few caveats and limitations to using this, but generally it does really obsolete those other cards especially if you're not some kind of power user and you're really just looking for something to get your system working. So enough talking about this thing. Here's an SD card. I copied some images and stuff onto there. Let's put this in and let's get this inside a computer and actually play around with it. So here's the inside of Leading Edge. This is the Model D, which is made by Daewoo. And I have a video on one of these before. So I'll link to that in the description if you're interested in seeing more about this machine. Now, if you are familiar with these machines, you might be wondering, why do I have a video card in here? And this is a CGA card. And that's because there's actually a fault on this motherboard where there's something wrong with the CGA circuitry. So I had to disable it and use this card. Otherwise, the monitor would just plug directly into the back of the computer because it has video output and I think serial parallel, stuff like that. This particular motherboard does have a built-in floppy drive controller. So the floppy drive is plugged into the motherboard right down there next to the power connector. But of course, if you get a PCXT, it does not have that. And if it doesn't have the floppy drive controller inside, then you're gonna have to buy one of those even just to use the floppy drive that might already be installed. And I just realized one of the big problems with this machine is the fan in this thing is super noisy. And with the lid off and it's sitting on the bench here, when I power this up, it's gonna be picked up by a microphone and I know it'll annoy me and maybe it'll annoy you as well. But, so I think I'm not gonna use this. I'll just grab another XT motherboard and we'll do testing with that. Here is our test setup. So I have a floppy drive controller plugged in along with a floppy drive. I'm just going to imagine I don't have any disks to boot this, like I have a boot disk right there, but I'm just going to imagine I don't. We have the CGA card plugged in here. This has 640K of RAM. What I can do on this motherboard is we could take this jumper off right here, and that will make this thing act as if these are 64K RAM chips in here, which essentially will give this computer 256K. And let's power this on. Now, I just powered this board on 
a moment ago, and there's a very interesting quirk with this motherboard. And it's not the motherboard, it's the RAM and the BIOS that's on here. When you first power on a computer that hasn't been used in a while, the RAM is uninitialized. And what the ROM BIOS does is it looks in the RAM to try to figure out if it's doing a warm reboot or a cold start. And I think what happens is there's some part of RAM that it looks for and it looks to see if it's initialized. Well, what happens with this RAM right here, and this is MT RAM 256 kilobits, is that it holds its contents for a long time when you power the computer off. So much so that I can turn the computer off for a while and when I turn it back on, instead of getting the normal BIOS boot screen where it counts up the memory, the BIOS is just assuming that it's a warm start, like I hit control alt delete and it skips that entire memory test. And we turn it back on now, I think that was just, you know, maybe 10 seconds or so. There we go, we're just getting a flashing cursor because it thinks I did a control alt delete and not a cold start. And there, it's trying to boot off the floppy disk, which of course is not in the machine. It's a very interesting quirk and it has to do with the memory on this board. And I just need to leave this machine off for a few minutes and then the RAM contents will decay enough that then the system will do a proper cold start. And unfortunately, I powered this thing on before I had the capture set to the right device. So it powered on with the cold start count, the RAM and everything, but I wasn't capturing that. And then when I turned the computer off and back on again, when I switched to the right input, now it's doing this warm start thing. <laughs> it's, it's really hilarious. As far as I'm aware, RAM like this is supposed to be refreshed every two milliseconds, I think. Otherwise the contents can start to decay. And this RAM, I mean, I can have it off for like minutes. Oh, there we go, finally. <laughs> or getting it to cold start. Um, and it, it seems to maintain the memory. It's just absolutely baffling. Anyhow, you can see right there, this computer has 256K, it's got one floppy drive, it's CGA graphics. It's exactly like the leading edges that I demoed. And that's what I really wanted to show. It's just all the same. This thing is essentially useless right now unless you have a floppy drive to boot this thing. So let's stick in the Pico Mem into any available slot here. Just like that, power the thing back on. There it is. I think we did a warm start again, but that's okay because it ran the ROM from the Pico RAM. I hit S for setup, and now we're in the Pico Mem setup utility. So I have to say, of all of these software-defined cards that have come out recently, none have had a BIOS-like setup utility built into them like this one does. And as you notice, this looks a lot like a more modern Phoenix-style BIOS that was used on you know, Pentium 3s and stuff like that, and Freddy modeled the user interface after that. So we can see here, it tells us about our system memory. So we have 256K, as we already knew. We have one floppy drive, we have zero hard drive. It says the Pico Mem IRQ is seven, and there's a jumper on the card itself that allows us to pick which IRQ is used. And as far as I'm aware, you do need to have an IRQ available on one of the three options, which looks like it is three, five, and seven on this card. And I think that's for certain emulations that actually requires the IRQ to work. If you have serial cards and parallel cards, then you might need to figure out which IRQs those are using and configure the Pico Mem to use the one that's free in your system. It's one of the joys of PC architecture. So we go over to the memory tab here, and this gives us an awesome memory map telling us exactly how the RAM is configured on this system. Now you can see at the top there, all those S's, that is the 256K of motherboard RAM represented. And those dashes are the free memory that is available for the Pico Mem to extend. In that higher section of memory there, there's some X's where the video memory sits. There's also some VV, which I think is also video memory. Then we have a bunch of dashes, which is free memory that's available for mapping up in that area, either for ROMs or RAM. And then you notice in the upper area there, there's two BBs under the zero D, and that's the ROM of the Pico Mem itself, which is how we're interfacing it at the moment. Then there's some more dashes, and then we have those four R's, and that is the basic and the ROM BIOS that's on this motherboard. I think if you didn't have basic, you would actually have a little bit more free memory up there, or you'd only have RR at the very top for just the system BIOS. So down with the options here, we can configure all sorts of things. We can turn on the EMS memory, and EMS memory does require an IO address. And that's because the way EMS memory works is it takes some RAM in the upper memory area there and it bank switches it. And you can have multiple megabytes of EMS memory and it does all that bank switching using an IO port. 
So you load an appropriate driver into DOS, and then it talks to that requisite I.O. port to then bank switch out that EMS memory. So if we just pick like 268, you notice there the EMS address is now E1000, and all those E's appeared at the top there, and that's where that bank switching is gonna go on to add that extra EMS memory. Software that supports EMS uses that driver. It's sort of a standard that I think Microsoft and Lotus came up with to add extended memory to PC XTs. And uh, it's pretty much standardized. And I think when you add EMS memory with this, it works like any other EMS memory that is exactly the same as those standalone cards that plug into the motherboard, like was on Tech Select, or you could buy period correct ones from the 80s and stuff like that. Now we go down here to maximize conventional memory. We can turn that on. And you notice that didn't really change anything on that memory map up above. We still have all just dashes above the 256K. But if we go here and we click on this Pico Mem RAM expansion, notice there we have some M's, but we still have a bunch of dashes. That means we still have not a full 640K. If we turn that off and we turn this one on, we now have PS RAM RAM expansion, and it's you know filling up that entire thing. Plus, we have a bunch of P's up in the upper region as well now, and that's upper memory. Now, the difference between PS RAM and PM RAM, PM standing for Pico Mem RAM, is the Pico Mem RAM is actually inside the microcontroller itself in the RP2040. It runs much faster, and that RAM runs at zero weight states, meaning it's just as fast as the RAM on the motherboard. So adding conventional memory with that PM option has no performance penalties whatsoever. On the other hand, the PS RAM expansion, that's the serialized RAM chip, which is one of the little RAM chips that's on this board. It's external to the Pi Pico. That does have weight states. And when you expand your conventional memory using that, you have, I think, six weight states, at least with the current firmware. And that does have a performance penalty. So anytime software is running inside of that extra RAM, it's gonna run quite a bit slower than what was on the motherboard. That performance limitation is one of the caveats that I mentioned that this card has, and there are others as well. So we'll get to kind of a full list of them, which are all outlined on the GitHub repo. I just didn't scroll down that far. But that performance penalty, when you fully expand the RAM, is not so great. So I would kind of recommend personally, if you had a motherboard that only has 256K, it's worth expanding it in another way that doesn't have that performance penalty. And I think, but don't quote me on this, that he said that he is working on a way to make that much faster than it currently is. And I think that might not require new hardware, but maybe it does. I'm not 100% sure on that. You can also have a combination, by the way, of PM RAM and PS RAM. So you notice we have M's and P's now. So that means that we get a little boost of extra memory, I think up to like around 384K in this configuration using zero weight state RAM and then the rest of it's gonna be slower. So you can combine those together or you can choose not to use PS RAM at all and just use the PM RAM. For now, we're gonna leave it on PM RAM and let's look at the other options. So we have a couple options to load third-party ROMs. Now, I don't have any on the SD card, so that doesn't work. But if I did have an extra ROM on there, like a diagnostic ROM, you'd be able to select it right here. And then what would happen is when the system booted up after the post, it would then look at those ROMs and it would actually execute that code. Over on the next tab here, this is where we have all the disk settings. So we have two floppy drives we can emulate. And remember, this doesn't replace the floppy drive controller that's on the motherboard. This patches the BIOS routines that normally goes to the floppy controller and it will replace it. So essentially, if we wanna boot the system off a floppy disk, we click enter on here and I have several disks on here and I can pick say, DOS 3.3, and it's a 1.4 meg image. And then the system, when it reboots, will actually allow us to boot that disk image, and it won't even try to boot the physical floppy drive that's on this system. It will replace it in DOS. So when you go to A colon, you're gonna go to the virtual disk that I've selected here. You'd have to go back in here, disable the disk, and then if you went back to DOS, you went to A colon, it would actually go to the physical disk drive. And as you can see, you can load two different disk images, and that's really because you can't swap the disk images once you're loaded up into DOS. You have to reboot and go back in the BIOS here to make that change. Maybe one day, Freddie can have a little TSR that you could run that you could bring up something to swap the disk while DOS is running, but that's not current functionality that exists. We also have four emulated hard drives that we can have, and these are just image files that are copied onto the SD card. And I actually made a copy of my compact flash cards that I always use on my XT IDE, and I just imaged it on my PC to a file, copied that onto here, and it just freaking works. So there's a bunch of different images on here, and some of them Freddie gave me, and some of them I downloaded, and it looks like this one here says error, so I guess that one doesn't work properly. But this CF card is actually my particular compact flash card that I always use, has all my programs on it, so that is really handy. For now, I'm just gonna set it to none for a little testing. 
The next option here is Pico Mem boot code, and you can turn this off to have the card coexist with XT IDE. So you can have them work together. If you don't have an XT IDE, it's really better to leave this on. It makes the performance of the emulated disc faster. So it's just better to have it on. And next we have an unimplemented option for the boot number. So I think if you have like four hard drives selected, you can go in here and quickly pick which one you want to boot, not implemented currently. There is a way to create brand new disc images in here. So what you can do is make like a, you know, 120 meg drive partition. I'm gonna call this Adrian. And what it will do is it'll create this on the SD card and I can mount that as say drive zero. And we will demonstrate this. Oh, I hit, there it is at the top, Adrian. And then uh, we'll format that. So we'll do that in a second. Uh, there's an advanced tab as well. So this allows you to configure the Wi-Fi modem. So you have to have a base IO. So I have it set for 360. And I guess that uses an IRQ. So that's currently set to seven. To change the IRQ, you have to change the jumper that's on the card itself. There's also the USB host stuff. So that's for the joystick support and the mouse support that's currently implemented on here. I currently don't have the USB on the go adapter, so I can't demonstrate that, but I've seen a video of it working and it seems to work perfectly. So it's a great way to avoid having to buy an expensive old analog PC joystick or a Gravis gamepad, and you can just plug a USB joystick right into this thing and it just freaking works. Like how great is that? A couple options here that don't currently do anything, I guess for future stuff. And that's really it. So now that we're done, we just hit escape and the system will reboot. And notice it says A to boot from floppy. Oh, and I missed that. So we're gonna have to hit control, delete again. And you can see the whole boot process here in real time. So there's the setup prompt. It gives us five seconds to go into that. And then we're gonna skip this and push A. And there it is, it's booting off DOS 3.3. So this is the emulated disk image that I picked. There is no real floppy drive or floppy disk in the drive here. And I think we should be able to F disk that particular disk. Look, it's freaking working. So no partitions defined, so create. NEC, I guess we're using NEC DOS. That's just one I had on my <laughs> on my thing here. So we can create a large one or an MS-DOS 3.3 compatible. We'll create a 3.3 compatible one. I think 32 megabytes is the largest size we can use. So this is a, you know, whatever, 120 meg disk. So it's gonna reboot. Now what's really awesome about all of this, right, is that you don't even need special tools to do any of this. We gotta boot from floppy again because we haven't formatted that. Now that's done, we can do format C slash S. Slash S, of course, copies the system over. And what's really cool here is I was able to create that image right inside the BIOS utility, and I just needed to find and download this DOS boot disk, and we're gonna be up and running in no time once this format process is done here. Now, my particular compact flash card, which I already have imaged onto here, is DOS 622, and it works perfectly fine with the Pico Mem. And that particular card was like 3.7 gigabytes. It's actually four gigabytes, I think is the limit for hard drive images. And that's because it's FAT32. So that's the limit of the size of that. But that 3.7 gig image that I have there works perfectly well, has a bunch of partitions on it, boots up DOS 622 and just works. So that format completed, that went relatively quickly. There's actually a blinky blinky light on the device itself, though on the Pi Pico blinks. I think it copied it all there. So if we go to the C drive now and we'll make a directory DOS, we'll copy the whole A drive over to it. And that's just so we have these DOS utilities. Okay, I guess that's a really blank <laughs> DOS disk. Anyhow, we hit control delete here and this should actually boot and we'll do it in real time here. This will boot right onto that hard drive image that we just formatted with DOS 3.3. Here we go. That was quick, booted right up. Very easy, no fuss, no muss. So right now it's sitting there counting up the free space. That's the slowest thing when you have really big partitions. And that's a 33 meg partition on an XT. It's not great with big partitions. If you use DOS, like a version of DOS that supports large partitions, if you have like a two gig partition, which DOS 6.2 supports, it takes a long time to count up the free bytes. But that's, that's the problem with these 4.77 megahertz machines. It's just slow. And if you use a faster one, it's gonna do that a lot faster. That's, that's no different than the XT IDE. So we hit Control Delete, press S for setup. Let's get rid of, oh, I didn't even check the memory. Oh, you know what, we'll, we'll load up into DOS 622 uh, with my compact flash card here. And we can get rid of this floppy disk there and exit out of there and just hit escape. And then we'll boot off the system. Let's you boot the, let's see it says, by the way, emulated memory, conventional memory, 128K. So what's interesting about the way the Pico Mem works is it does not add the extra memory when you first power on the computer. So at a cold start, 
the computer will still only count up to 256K. That is it. And at first I thought there was a mistake, like something was wrong. But the reality is in DOS, with a later version has a mem command, we now have a full 384K. And this is the memory that's running at full speed, right? Because we're using the, the internal memory on the Pico mem itself. So that's just a little caveat you have to know about that, you know, if you cold start your computer and you're like, hey, it's not working, the conventional memory, it is actually working. It just, you just can't tell. So let's go back into setup here and we'll change the memory to use the PM memory. Well, we'll do both, right? So we'll get that extra memory filling up the full 640K. And why don't we turn on EMS while we're at it? I think this can all coexist. And let's hit escape now. And by the way, it says HMA not available loading DOS low. And that's because DOS 622 is trying to load stuff high in high memory, but it's expecting a 286 or later, or maybe even a 386. You have to use special utilities to do that on an XT. DOS does not support that natively. Let's see how much RAM we actually have here. Oh, okay, we have a full 640K. So yeah, it did add the extra conventional memory. Now I don't have the EMS driver loaded and you can't use something like EMM386 because of course that's for a 386. So on my hard drive image here, I have the Pico Mem utilities. Let's see if we can get that EMS memory working. So there's PM EMM, the extended memory manager for the Pico Mem board. Now, Freddie worked with Lowtech, as you can see, and Lowtech actually makes an EMS board. So I think this is their driver. It's just been adapted to work with the Pico Mem. Do I know how to use this? Not really. It does say device equals pmm.exe. That implies it needs to go into config.sys. So we'll go add it there. I'm just looking at these other options here. Do I need to worry about any of these? I don't know. I'm going to leave those alone. So I've added it to the very first line there. It knows I have highmem.sys remmed out because that does not work on an XT. And I think I don't have a typo there. So let's reboot the system now and see how much EMM memory we have. As far as I'm aware, there's three megabytes available, but I haven't tested this yet. So we're in uncharted territory for things going wrong. Oh, here it goes. It's detecting pages. I guess I could have said bypass memory test. There's really no reason to test the RAM on a card like this because we're using like a tiny little SPI type memory chip. It's very unlikely to be bad, especially compared to all the chips on this motherboard, which you know my luck, RAM tests galore. So look, lots of memory. Oh, I can escape bypass, but I can escape that by pushing escape. So there we go, 255 pages available. There it is, four megabytes of RAM available. So we now have four megs of EMS memory available on this old XT. Yeah, that's freaking awesome. So I don't know if DOS can detect that EMS memory with a mem command, but let's see. Oh, it does. Total expanded memory, four freaking megabytes. Not quite four megabytes, it's like slightly less, I think. It would be 4,096K, but that is awesome. I don't really have programs installed on my computer that can detect EMS memory, but I know Check It can, because at least it can do a, a RAM test of it. So let's just see if it sees the EMS memory properly. I'm assuming it will because DOS did. So expanded memory, as you can see, at least with Check It, can go up to 32 megabytes. So for people with really old, slow computers like XTs who really want to have a ton of memory, there you go. You can have 32 megs, but we have four megs available on this card. And the two meg EMS card that was on TechSelect was like $70. $7. So we got out cheap with uh, four megs for only 60 bucks, plus all this other functionality. So right now to recap where we are, we have a bone stock 4.77 megahertz XT that has a floppy drive that I don't have any disk to boot on. Let's just hypothetically. And I put this one card in and now we can access disk images. We can access hard drive images. We can add four megs of EMS memory to our system. We can expand our conventional memory all the way to 640K with the performance penalty, mind you. It's still expanded, which means we can run software with that full 640K. And we even have some upper memory available to load stuff into as well, which could free up some additional conventional memory because we only have 563 available there. I'm not gonna go through all the exercises to get that working. There's a bunch of custom drivers you have to use and stuff like that. That has nothing to do with Pico Mem. This is just standard upper memory stuff with XTs and DOS. But if you look out there, there's threads on Vogons about getting that working and stuff like that. And uh, it's not too hard but it will give you that little bit of extra memory. So that's available to us as well. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna switch this machine back to a full 640K on the motherboard. All I need to do is put that jumper in place. That will tell the motherboard that these are 256 kilobit chips and those are 64. It is gonna count up to 640K now and that is what's on the motherboard. That has nothing to do with the Pico Mem. And we'll just go into the Pico Mem once this uh, comes up and I'll disable the conventional memory expansion. Now, the reason why I'm doing this is because there is a performance penalty to using DOS 622 with the expanded memory, 
With older versions of DOS, like 3.3, it loads DOS into the lower part of RAM, and that means it's the high performance part of memory on the motherboard. But with DOS 6.2.2, it actually loads itself into the top of memory, right at the very top, which means it's in that part of memory that has the performance penalty when we're expanding it. So it looks like because I changed the memory configuration on here, it actually lost the configuration for all the RAM stuff on here. Normally that's actually saved onto the SD card, so it does survive across reboots. We'll just turn EMS back on, but we'll leave the RAM expansion stuff off. And uh, I think everything else should be saved. Yes, it is. And what I wanted to demonstrate now is the networking capabilities. Now, I've already gone ahead and configured MTCP. That's Mike Brutman's TCP stack for DOS. There's a packet driver that is used in conjunction with the Wi-Fi chip that's on here. That's the custom part. MTCP is totally off the shelf software, but the packet driver was necessary for it to work with this. Right now, the entire Wi-Fi feature is in beta, so to configure the Wi-Fi name and password, you put a little text file on the SD card itself, and that's where it configures itself from. I think in the future, the idea will be maybe there's like an option inside the BIOS setting there where you can configure the Wi-Fi without having to do it on a file. I use MTCP on my other DOS machines in conjunction with network cards, physical network cards, so I can transfer files on and off those machines using FTP or you know do other things that are kind of nerdy and silly and pointless <laughs> with networking on DOS. But those files are copied onto this image, which comes from my compact flash image. And right now I just run the command network, which is a batch file that will start the packet driver, which you'll see right here. There it is, Pico Mem detected. And it's loading the packet driver and it has an ethernet address. I'm using IO address 360 and that's configured in the ROM BIOS and the interrupt is seven. Now, the funny thing is it's sitting here and you might be wondering what's going on. <laughs> the problem is, is when it gets a DHCP address from your server is it needs to update a config file on the uh, storage medium. And because it's a two gig partition, it takes a really long time to update the file allocation table after saving that. If the partition size weren't so large, it would update the fat much faster. And it's one of the reasons why you should never use two gig partitions on an XT class machine. It's just really slow and painful anytime you have to do anything to update the fat, which is anytime you save a file, basically. Anyhow, we are online now. So if I go ping google.com, theoretically, it's gonna take a second to load here off the disk. It should actually work. And uh, there we go. We're pinging Google over Wi-Fi on this bone stock XT with this $60 card. How cool is that? Now, what you can also do now that we're online is we can tell it to a BBS. So I went and looked this up. I just found a regular BBS, which is hopefully online. I recently demoed a BBS on a second channel video, and unfortunately I would just do that. But I went to go to use it today and it wasn't working. It's like down or something right now. So yeah, attack bbs.synchro.net. That's just the one I'm trying right now. Please don't go and crash their BBS or whatever if you watch this video. And there it is. It connected up very quick. And I have ansi.sys running on this thing, or I think I have, I don't know, a faster version of it. And it works. So guest, do you have mouse support? No, and that's because if you're using like a Linux terminal, it does that, but no PCs will do that. We do have extended character support though. It wants our full name, Adrian Black. I'm gonna put a fake email address there, sorry about that. Portland, Oregon for a city state. I got this from telnet bbsguy.net. There we go, look at that, Synchronet, hit a key. Doo -doo 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 -doo. So yeah, this is all working over telnet right now. Of course, if you use like a serial Wi-Fi modem, you could do this kind of stuff as well, but it's pretty sweet that it's just built into this thing. And yeah, it allows you to easily access stuff like this. Let's quit out of here. Let's hit that. We're just logged in as a guest here. There's the main menu. Who knows what you can do on there? Let's see, user list, logons today, guest. Oh, Portland, Oregon. That was me earlier and then someone from South Carolina. So we're gonna log off, which should drop us back into DOS, the American connection. Yes, there we are. So as I mentioned, another thing that's awesome is we can FTP and I actually run a little retro FTP server at home here. It's in a, it's in a Docker container because it doesn't really have any security on it. And I just have some retro files there. I think it's at this address, although maybe it's not. Ah, uh, no, I just realized it's at address.9. Let's try that again. I should probably create a little cheat sheet for myself that just sort of shows the IP addresses of the various resources I have on my home network for things like SMB shares that are low security FTP. And there it is. Yeah, VSFTP, it's running in a Docker container. 
Yeah, I don't really remember what the login is. Maybe it's FTP, FTP. Yeah, that's secure, isn't it? It has nothing sensitive on it whatsoever, just some old retro files, so it doesn't even matter. Of course, it's not exposed to the internet, but if someone were to access it inside my network for some reason, they just get access to a bunch of old games and other junk, so it doesn't really matter. And I changed into the PC directory here, and there's some stuff. It's basically a copy of actually what's on the uh, compact flash card. Let's try downloading a file here, pcjunior.ans. See if this works. I think this is a little ANSI graphic that I made in the draw. There we go, transfer complete. I mean, 10K per second, but this is a very slow computer, right? We're talking like a 1981 computer here that's actually on the internet right now. Well, I mean, theoretically it's on the internet. PCJunior.ans. Oh, <laughs> I typed ping instead of type. I'm not sure what I was thinking there. Let's try that again. There it is. Yep, the ANSI graphic that I made. And um, it's the PC Junior splash screen. The only difference is it's an 80 column. So the 640K OK doesn't look quite right because of the splash screen on the real PC Junior is in 40 column text. But yeah, I made that in the draw years ago. And it's kind of cool when you boot up an old system like this. But hey, I just downloaded this off of my server over Wi-Fi using the Pico Mem. How freaking cool is that? I have said that so many times. I apologize. People are probably sick of that now. I pretty much showed all the features that I can easily show on this. I can't show the USB functionality right now because I just don't have a USB on the go adapter. But what we can do is switch to this card here and test out the ad lib support. So I'll just switch my SD card over to this card and I'll just plug in the audio cable to the DAC like so. And we'll pop this into a, any available slot, power on the machine. With this Pico Gus install, we have a new tab here for audio, global output on and ad lib on. And that's all it takes to enable the ad lib emulation while the rest of the emulation is still running. Let's try out the AdLib jukebox. I don't have a lot of programs on my CF card or the image here that actually support AdLib on an XT. Generally, AdLib, by the time it came out, it was really, it was really designed to work on things like 286s and faster. If you had an AdLib card back in the day, you're gonna be well aware of this piece of software. It was bundled with the card and with these glorious, well, I don't know about so glorious, but these CGA graphics, these songs are probably all burned into your mind because you probably listened to all of these just to hear that sweet, sweet FM sound. Let's try the first song here. All right, that's no 8-bit dance party, but hey, it was working and playing properly. I forgot the other one that I thought was pretty good. Uh, not very busy. Let's see. They released a whole bunch of different, um, I guess, albums, you can call it, with different sets of songs. So maybe this was not the one that was included with everything, but it's the one that I remember from back in the day. Let's try Railroad Story. Anyhow, there it is. The AdLib emulation on this, as far as I'm aware, is probably based on the same code that the Pico Gus uses. So it's pretty true and authentic emulation that will sound pretty good. Maybe only the most discerning FM synthesis fans will be able to tell the difference between the real AdLib and this card. So those are the features I want to demonstrate for the Pico Mem. As I mentioned earlier, you can plug in a USB mouse and a game controller, so you can avoid having to buy a serial mouse and a PC game controller for your old PC, especially because if you want to use either of those, you need to have functional serial ports, and you have to have a sound card or some kind of a card that has a game port on it as well. So that's just more hardware you don't have to buy if you end up with one of these Pico Mems. Now let's talk about the elephant in the room that I alluded to earlier in the video. This card is not without its limitations and, well, idiosyncrasies that make it maybe not the best solution if you're looking for optimal performance on your PC XT. The first big limitation I wanna remind everyone about is that the RAM expansion for the conventional memory and the EMS memory that this thing adds, the four megabytes of RAM that it adds, is slower than if you're adding those via a dedicated ISA card in your system. That mainly comes from the fact that right now, the PS RAM, that's the eight megabyte RAM chip that's added onto this board, 
has extra latency and the Raspberry Pi Pico is doing a lot when it comes to all this emulation that's happening on the system. So that added latency just means there are additional wait states when that RAM is used. So that means if you go to use that RAM for programs or whatnot, your system is gonna run slower than if you had a dedicated ISA card installed in your computer. Now, I haven't personally done any benchmarks to see how much slower things are when you're using that RAM versus not, but I do notice that if I've expanded this motherboard to 640K and I load DOS 622, which remember loads itself into the upper part of the conventional memory block, which is the slow memory on the Pico Mem, things do feel a little bit slower. Just generally poking around the operating system, loading programs and stuff just feels a little bit more sluggish. Part of that effect it might just be that I know it should be slower, so maybe my brain thinks it's slower. Without using a stopwatch to time how long things take, it's hard to quantify exactly how much slower it is, but it does feel a little bit slower. The next limitation I wanna mention is the floppy emulation. Now, I talked about this earlier that it is not emulating an actual floppy controller like the one I have installed in this system right here. Freddie told me he's using code from DOSBox to actually emulate the floppy drives, and I think the hard drive as well, with this. So that means that things that work in DOSBox when it comes to accessing disks should be fine in here. But it's gonna be possible there are certain programs that talk directly to the disk controller that aren't gonna work because they're actually looking for the controller IC itself. So keep that in mind that it's not true emulation. And if you really need that, you're gonna need a floppy controller installed in the computer and something like a GoTech or of course a real floppy drive. And then those things are going to work. On the leading edge computer, which you can see behind me there, the BIOS on that machine actually needs to have a functional floppy drive controller and at least one working floppy drive. Otherwise, when you boot up the system, you will get an error. And with Pico Mem installed and the floppy drive emulation turned on, if you disable the floppy drive controller on that computer, or you say remove the floppy drive, every time you power on the computer, it's gonna give you a disk error and you hit, have to hit F1. Once you're booted up into DOS, the disk drive still works, but that's just a little bit of a limitation with the way the emulation works. Now let's dovetail into the hard drive emulation of this. The performance of the hard drive emulation is really good in some ways. It's even faster than the XT IDE, but it's actually a little bit slower in other ways. And specifically, it's slower in the random sector access times. So that's accessing little tiny sectors. So there is a little bit of a performance implication using the disk emulation on this versus an XT IDE. Although it's not really that noticeable, at least on this XT, and that's because the 4.77 megahertz XT is so slow anyways, the performance slowdown on the disk emulation on this isn't particularly noticeable. Overall, disk access on the XT is just really slow anyways. And as I mentioned, using a two gigabyte partition on well, an XT IDE or this, it's just horribly slow on a machine this slow. Now, I have been chatting with Freddie about the disk performance issues and not specifically on this card, but just in general on the XT. And he actually has some ideas about how to really improve disk performance for slow computers like this. And one of the things he just mentioned offhand, and I can't talk about if this is ever gonna be implemented or when it's gonna come, was caching the file allocation table, the FAT, in the PS RAM buffer on this card. That would mean potentially when you're accessing the FAT, like say you're doing a directory for the first time, it's counting up the free space, or you're saving a file, that it won't need to read and write directly from the micro SD card to recalculate the free space or whatever it's doing. It can do it inside the cache on this card, which theoretically should be far faster than actually doing it across the micro SD card. And then later it would need to flush those buffers, I guess, from the cache on here into the actual SD card. Not really sure how all of that would work. The final thing I wanna mention, so I've tried the Pico Mem on some other systems besides 4.77 megahertz XTs like this. And while it works on faster computers, there are limitations. The RP2040 chip that's on here on the Raspberry Pi Pico is basically running overclocked, like at the limit, it can't go any faster. And it's really only just barely able to keep up with the ISA bus. So if you put this into a system that has say a 10 megahertz ISA bus, I don't think this card's gonna work very reliably. It may, but it may not as well. This particular XT has an ISA bus that's just running at 4.77 megahertz, but apparently some XT machines have really tight timing, even at 4.77 megahertz, and there are some issues with the Pico Mem. Freddie talks about these issues on the GitHub repo, and again, the cool thing is, because this is a software-defined card, firmware updates can actually fix a lot of those things, and I think a lot of incompatibility bugs have already been fixed throughout the well, development and beta testing of this product. I did try the Pico Mem on my 36SX system with an ISA bus running around seven and a half megahertz, and it worked just fine on that. But ultimately, there isn't a huge reason to use something like the Pico Mem because that computer can already go up to, I don't know, 16 megabytes of RAM right on the motherboard. And because that system has 16-bit ISA slots, you're gonna be losing a lot of performance if you use this card for hard drive emulation. 
Of course, disk drive emulation is still something that's pretty useful. If you don't have a way to make disks, you want to boot floppy disks, it is pretty nice to have something like this available to emulate the floppy drives, and that absolutely will work on that faster system, at least if the ISA bus is not running too fast. So the leading edge Model D is all booted up with the Pico Mem installed, and I put the one in there with the audio DAC on it. So we have AdLib emulation as well, but we booted off the compact flash drive image that I had on the micro SD card, and it's working great. So we'll turn that off for a little more quiet. <laughs> the fan in there is just so loud. Anyhow, so that's the Pico Mem. I'm pretty impressed by it. And I love these software defined cards. It started with the Apple II VGA card and then the Pico Gus and now the Pico Mem. It's really amazing to see how far people are able to push that little $5 microcontroller board. It's absolutely fantastic to see all these different kinds of emulation on one card and new features constantly being added all the time. If you can't tell, I really like the Pico Mem. It's really impressive how so many features have been crammed into this particular card, and the features just keep coming. And that's what's really exciting about these software-defined cards. When I was first given the 1.0 version of this card at VCF Midwest last year, it didn't even have a bunch of these features, and, well, now they're there, fully working. Well, or almost fully working when it comes to the AdLib support. The only thing I wish this card did better was faster RAM emulation and maybe that disk caching algorithm that Freddie talked about for the large partitions on these slow XT machines. You can bet your bottom dollar that if a better and faster Raspberry Pi Pico comes out, that Freddy's gonna re-implement the hardware using that chip, and that should hopefully add additional speed and capabilities to the card that are kind of pushing the limit of this current RP2040 chip. So there you go. If you found this video interesting, I'd appreciate a thumbs up, but if you didn't, you know what to do. Huge thanks to my patrons. Their names are shown up the side of the screen. They make it possible that I do this full time. If you wanna become a supporter, you can do so at the link in the description below. And huge thanks for Freddy for sending in this latest version 1.1 and also listening to me complain about various features on Discord. I think already he's been updating some stuff because of feedback that I've given. And of course, as more and more people get this card into their hands, then of course people will report issues and hopefully Freddy can fix those as well. Hit subscribe if you haven't already and you know all the other YouTube junk. And that's gonna be that. So stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.